Well, good evening. Good to see you tonight. We want to thank you for coming out to church. And uh, the Lord is honored by that. There's no doubt about that because he tells us to do it. And when we are here, he is pleased. And I would encourage you to look in the bulletin to see all the announcements that we have. I just want to remind you that this week, tonight, tomorrow night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night will be our prayer conference. And uh, we invite each and every one of you to uh, come on out and to participate throughout the course of the week, 7 o'clock each night. And uh, we're going to be hearing tomorrow night from Alex Sittman and what prayer means to him. Tuesday night from Ron Lunghofer and then Wednesday night from Pat uh, Walk. And uh, I just want to encourage you to come out uh, simply because we need to learn to pray. And um, I'm going to encourage you, if you can, also at some time throughout the course of this week. And I know that a lot of you have Amazon and, and the Monongahela and Allegheny and all the other river networks if you can get anything by E.M. Bounds on prayer, I would encourage you to get it and to read it. I'm going to, as a part of my message tonight, read something to you from here. Every year when we go through the week of prayer, I do a lot of reading in this book, and I'm going to share some things out of that tonight. And uh, I would encourage you, if you would please, to take some time if, to buy the book if you can. If not, uh, download it and, and read anything. He's got a number of uh, books on prayer, Power Through Prayer, Prayer and the Praying Man, Purpose in Prayer, Essentials of Prayer, The Necessities of Prayer, Possibilities of Prayer, The Reality of the Prayer, The Weapon of Prayer, and uh, you can get them all in one volume. And I would encourage you uh, to do what you can, but that's throughout the course of this week. We'll be meeting here to pray. And I trust also that you have your prayer guide. Does everybody have the annual prayer guide? And uh, I would encourage you to keep it, not only throughout the course of this week, uh, including our missionaries and ministry members. There are 25 entries in here, and we're going to be looking at that throughout the course of the week and praying for them. And uh, so, as you know, our prayer conference uh, on weeknights no bells and whistles. We come in, we hear the word of God, and we pray. And that's what I want to encourage you to do throughout the course of this week. And then don't forget that next Sunday morning, we're going to be having our special service to honor the police. We have a number of the police departments who will be here. And um, I will be speaking uh, with regard to our responsibility toward the police, centering it around our motto, In God We Trust. Because as you know, just recently... Uh, through the efforts of Matt Statchmas, one of our own members, why the uh, motto, In God We Trust, has been put up in the city council room, and uh, we're working on getting them in other places too. But uh, that'll be next week, and uh, we'd encourage you to be out. Now, if you came in today, you saw we had our own security guard here. And, of course, if you were here during our business meeting, you know why. And... Um, we believe that, well, let me just put it this way. As your shepherd, who has the responsibility to provide for your care, um, we want you to feel safe when you come into church. Now, as you know, we have a security team here at the church of several different men who, who always are guarding and watching for security around the church while we are here. But um, after what actually took place down in Texas, when the folks there in that church lost over half of their congregation one Sunday morning, our deacons and pastoral staff wanted to give you a gift. And that gift was to have a security here. And we're going to do it on a three-month trial to see how it works. We paid for it. The church didn't pay for it. We paid for it, the deacons and the pastoral staff, because we want you to feel comfortable when you come into church and don't have to worry about anything. And uh, just be here to worship the Lord. And so uh, he's out there somewhere. He was greeting people this morning and opening. He's the best greeter we've had in a long time. <laughs> and people have to respond to him because he's... Uh, it should be responded to. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, that's our gift to you. 
for your protection. And don't forget, uh, and I'm going to see that more books are put out there, this book on Tortured for Christ. I bought 50 of these for you to take and read. And you'll see that they're worth $16.99. You can take them for free as long as you what? Read it. You can take it for free as long as you what? You can read it as long as you what? That's right. And I would encourage you, and once these all go, we will see that there are more offered. But please, in the days and age age in which we live, this is a great thing uh, to read about this fellow's testimony. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Pastor Chaz. If somebody wants to pay for it, they don't have to read it. <laughs> You're reading into things. Oh, okay. <laughs> Speaking of reading, we're going to have our scripture reading this evening. We're going to start with the book of Romans tonight. So I encourage you all to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. I also ask you to stand out of the respect of the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 1. We'll be reading the first seven verses of Romans chapter 1, and we'll be reading this responsively. And the Word of God says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Holy Father, I do thank you as we read these verses and just to think about the relationship that we can have with you. Uh, We thank you that you did send your son to die on the cross for us. We thank you that he was made flesh. And all that came out of love that you had for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, I pray we don't take that for granted. I pray that we try to strengthen our relationship with you each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Reverence is going to lead us in worship. Psalm 105, 1 and 2 reads, O give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. That is what we would like to do tonight as we open our song service. Talk about his wondrous works and reasons to serve him. How many reasons do you have to serve him tonight? Join us in singing 10,000 Reasons.
us, Lord, you have my heart. that we're going to do tonight is a new one that uh, um, I've brought to, to Reverence and said this would be a fun one to sing. What is fun about it too is we have the men are going to start out with the first verse and then we're going to all sing the chorus together. Then the women are going to sing the second verse and then join in the chorus and everybody sings the bridge. And then the last one it says rise up church. So I want the whole congregation to really shout out and sing. I'm going to have Chaz and Mr. Davis over there. He's going to, they're going to lead the men. And then Reverence over here is going to lead the women. Now the chorus goes, shout to the north and the south. So when we get to shout, I would love to hear everybody say, shout to the north and the the south. So we're going to go ahead and start with it.
guys did a very good job over here. No. I'll give you my mic, but you're on your own.
that's the message that we need to get out. Thank you. You may be seated that Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. We we'll invite our men to come as we receive our evening offering and give unto the work of the Lord at this time. Our Father in heaven, as we come to you this evening, we thank you for the truth of that song that your son, the Lord Jesus, is the Lord of heaven and earth and uh, the King of kings and the Savior of the world. And Father, I just pray that every one of us will be, be aware of that in our day-by-day -day life and share that with people that we come in contact with consistently. We do thank you, Lord, that we can give unto you, realizing that through giving unto you, we have the opportunity to exalt you, to praise you, and to worship you, and also to contribute to the ongoing of the preaching of the Word of God from this place. Lord, I pray that you will take your Word tonight that we preach and use it for your glory. But from this place, through the Internet, we know we have the opportunity to get out the Word of God, and it's our tithes and our offerings that contribute to that. And so, Lord, as we give unto you tonight, we thank you for the privilege of being able to financially stand behind the proclamation of the Word of God to the people who know it for their edification and the people who don't know it for their evangelization and, above all, to your exaltation. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
right, thank you very much, Lisa. I would assume that was the Lord's Prayer. Very, very beautiful. I, I like that song very, very much. Well, we're going to continue singing to the north and to the south and the east and the west. Take your hymn books and turn to number 662, standing as we sing, Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done from us, north, south, east, and west. So stand and sing it out. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. missions moments before you this, this evening we are looking here to to pray for Josh Browns with Missionaries International and the question we have is if we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel how do we get to some of these remote areas that you can't take a car into or trains or you know TWA surely doesn't get there well, Josh Brown felt callings into missions, and this is the emphasis where he felt called to be, to, to get missionaries into, into those remote regions and countries. Uh, this was his endeavor. This is his calling. We need to stand behind him. Along with that, we never know when an emergency arises. Uh, maybe something with the government, a coup, where they have to, and missionaries have to be removed right away. Maybe some kind of an accident, a physical accident. But Josh has heard the call to, to fill this need, I and mean, we want to pray for him. And, you know, it's been several years now since he's dedicated his life to this, and as we see in his prayer bulletin for this week, that he's, that he's passed a written part of the exam. Coming in February, he'll be taking the, the actual test for the pilot and becoming a pilot, and we need to pray for that. And, uh, talking with Josh whenever he gets home several times, there's parts we just don't think about, that he gets into the remote areas and the plane breaks down. You know, he just can't call the three A's to have his plane towed back to the, the garage. You know, he can't call the Dave Kolarski to come fix my motor. He has to be able to handle this and to be able to do these with whatever he has at hand. And so we need to pray for Josh. We need to pray for his experience that he gets that he can perform these tasks and that the same way that God would uphold him. The next thing on his prayer list has been a prayer of his from well, three months after he arrived in, uh, on campus that he would have a roommate that he could lead to, to the Lord. And he had one roommate and that fella had, had gotten married and moved him and his wife had moved away. But now Josh has another man working there and the opportunity to to lead him to Christ. So let's be sure that we pray for Josh. Pray not just for this man, that, but he would buy up every opportunity that comes his way to, to see the fruit of his ministry. Pray for his safety as, as he is in the air flying. 
Again, we can always be thankful we're in God's will. We're safe there as we are any place we can hide. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we do come before you this evening. And Father, the opportunity that we can come before the Almighty God, before your throne, to humble ourselves and make our requests known to you. Father, that's, that's greater than great. That, that is actually the amazement of having you as a father. And as we do this on behalf of Josh this evening, Father, I pray that not only would you give him the opportunity to minister to his roommate, to share the gospel with him, but Father, there's others he could come in contact with that, that he would be able to tell them of this gift, this gift that you have given, free for the taking if we only receive it. Father, for so many praises, as, as we know in his, his family, that he has a grandmom who's not well. We know his, his sisters are serving you. Father, his mother was a missionary. And Father, from a very young age, he's been instilled to, to do your work. But Father, as you have called him, he, he has went. And now, Father, I, I pray that you would support him. You would lead, guide, and direct, whether it be be in the air flying the plane, on the ground repairing the plane, or Father, just walking daily with you, that it would be a time of closeness, that he could feel your presence, as we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Ron, for keeping us an update on our missionaries, and particularly Mr. Brown. All right, the next song, number 542, is the course of a song that's called The Family of God. We're gonna sing the course through once, then we'd like to have different ones of you folks tell us why you are glad to be a part of the family of God. So um, the next time we sing this, we'll try to have the overhead on the, the words on the screen so that we can sing the entire song, okay? All right, 542, let's sing it through once, and then uh, some people say, why am I glad to be a part of the family of God? Let's stand and sing it now. Ready? Uh Somebody else? Are you glad you're a part of the family of God? Yes, Mr. Dave. I'm glad I'm part of the family of God. Because in this family here, I have a father, my earthly family, family I did not. I'm glad to be a part of the family of God. Even though I can't see you, I truly believe you know who it is and how he shines bright. Amen. Yeah. Another. Okay, Barbara. I'm glad to be part of the family of God because, well, for one thing, that's true love. Your father, my father, is true. And I know when he says things in his word, I can trust him. I know they're true. And my brothers and sisters that I have here, they also show true love. Amen. Another. Yes. Uh, I'm glad I'm part of the family of God because I know I'm cleansed by the first step. Yeah. I'm cleansed by the blood and washed by God. So I know that I'm saved. I'm, I'm part of the family of God that's going to be in heaven uh, for eternity. Amen. Another. Well, let's sing it through one more time, and then by that time, maybe somebody can think of something, and then um, we'll close. Uh
Anybody else? All right. You may be seated. It seems like a long walk. It was really quiet. Um, song that I'm going to sing tonight was one that um, <clears throat> was written by Tommy Dorsey. And he was an African-American um, pastor. Dad was a pastor. His mom's a missionary. He grew up in church. Um, he was married. <clears throat> he had um, a wife who was expecting, and he was called off to a revival out of town. And he didn't want to go, and his wife said, go anyway. You need to go. This is ministry. Well, while he was that night in ministry, he got a telegram saying that um, his wife had given birth and she had passed away. Someone came and drove him back. He got in town just in time for his son to pass away. And it sort of took his heart to a very low place. And as he was listening to some music that he'd heard before, he just started saying, precious Lord, precious Lord, precious Lord. And he wrote the song, precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on and help me to stand. I am tired, I'm weak, and I'm worn. But through the storm and through the night, Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on. So you might think this is a really sad song. But you know what the song tells us is that in our lowest point, in our weakest hour, simple words like precious Lord bring us into his presence where he can heal us. And Tommy Dorsey went on to do many, many great things in ministry. This was just the song the Lord used to pull him out of a very low spot in his life. And I think we've all been there at some point or another. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me to stand. I am tired and I am weak and I Certainly, we, we all do need to make that our prayer, don't we? And make it a real prayer. Precious Lord, lead me on. Thank you, Val. We appreciate that. If you have a copy of God's Word tonight, I would encourage you to turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 11. This, of course, is our week of prayer, and um, we're looking forward to hearing from uh, three of the deacons throughout the course of this week. And tonight, uh, as a part of the week of prayer, I just want to share with you eight great principles of prayer from this passage, and we only will be highlighting them. 
We'll not be looking at them in detail uh, because there's a lot there. But interestingly enough, they're just in a couple of verses. And it's amazing how rich a verse of scripture can be. But I want us to read uh, to lay the foundation for this study from Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, and then verses 20 through 26. Mark chapter 11, 12 through 14, and then 20 through 26. And I invite you to stand out of respect for God and His Word as I read and you follow along. Mark chapter 11 and verse 12. The Word of God says, On the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he, that is Jesus, was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. Now verse 20. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remember and saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. For if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. God has promised that he would bless his word, and we thank him for it. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have had tonight just to read your word, and we could say the benediction and go home, because it's your word to us. But I pray for a few moments as we meditate upon your word, that you would teach us great things, that we might advance our prayer life. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This morning, as I began my message entitled, When You Pray, taken from Matthew chapter 6, I opened with 16 questions. 16 questions. And um, I'm wondering how you responded to those 16 questions. Those 16 questions were designed to get our attention. I want to read them again to you. I was watching this afternoon the football game. And in watching the football game, there came a commercial came on about another program that is going to air. And I don't know about you, but when I watch the commercials, I forget what they're advertising and just focus on the commercial. I, I can tell you what the commercial says, but I can't tell you what they're advertising. Well, in this commercial, there are two boys talking and uh, back and forth. And they were talking about sin. And the one boy said to another boy, you're a sinner. Well, the fellow who was addressed said, no, I'm not a sinner. And the other fellow said, well, that's what the Bible tells us, that we've all sinned. And the boy that he was talking to responded by saying, that's what I don't like about your religion. It makes me feel guilty. And I said to Nancy, what he felt was what? Conviction. And uh, I don't know, did you, did you see that day? Those of you watching the football game, some of you saw that. And, you know, it's true when we preach the Word of God or when we give messages based upon the Word of God, it should make us examine our lives. It may bring some guilt. It may bring some conviction. That's what the Word of God's designed to do. And these questions that I began the message with this morning were designed not to give us a guilt trip, but to get us to think. I mentioned this morning, if you recall, that the most powerful tool God has given us, and yet perhaps the least used tool by believers, is prayer. Remember that? 
And here are the questions that I asked to get us all to think about where our prayer life really is. Because without prayer, we're not going to really see the Lord work. And that's why we have a week of prayer every January, the first full week of the, of the year. And I, again, encourage you to take this particular prayer guide home and pray throughout the course of the week, throughout the course of the year. But be with us tomorrow night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night as we continue to focus on pray and prayer and as we do pray. But here are these questions, and um, I ran down through them this morning. I probably ought to print them up so that each of us could put them in our Bibles. But here they are again. You answer them. Why do you pray? How would you describe your prayer life? When others ask you to pray for them, do you or do you just think about them or perhaps even forget about them altogether? Remember I mentioned this morning that so many times when somebody is ill, they will uh, be talking to another person and that person will say, well, I've been thinking about you. What does thinking do? Nothing. Well, it, I hope it, they hope they're good thoughts, but it sure doesn't bring health and strength to them. Thinking is not synonymous with praying. So how do you respond? Number four, do you like to pray? If not, why not? Five, do you look for opportunities to pray? If not, why not? Taking into consideration that prayer is talking to God. Why wouldn't you want to talk to him? Number six, do you attend prayer meetings regularly? If not, why not? Isn't it a shame that the least attended prayer meeting of the average fundamental church today is prayer meeting? And if you look around, you'll find that some churches don't even have prayer meetings anymore. What does that say about the nature of the church? I believe that if we want to talk to God, we will attend every prayer meeting. We have the opportunity to attend whatever that prayer meeting may be. But many have neglected the prayer meeting these days. Number seven, what has your prayer life done for you? Number eight, what has your prayer life done for others? In other words, can you see answers to prayer? But number nine, what has your prayer life done for God? Remember, our prayer is designed not just to get from God, but to glorify God. And that's the essence of that question. Number ten, what all do you include in your prayers? In other words, are they a list of gimme, 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 gimme? Or are they real conversations with God? Number 11, how important is prayer to you? And of course, you can answer that by taking a look to see how, how often you pray, how you do pray, how you do attend prayer meetings, how you do spend time with the Lord in prayer. Number 14, do you believe your prayers? I'm going to talk about that a little bit this evening. Number 15, for whom do you pray? Who does the Bible tell us where to pray for? All people. Right. And number 16, what is your favorite Bible verse on prayer? What is it? Those are the questions that I began the message with this morning. And um, I want to read for you a little bit from E.M. Bounds' book on the prayer, and he has in here a segment entitled, God Has Everything to Do with Prayer. And I want you to listen to this very, very carefully. Based upon these questions I've just read. Prayer is God's business to which men can attend. Prayer is God's necessary business, which men can only do, and that men must do. And of course, in this, when he's talking about men, he's talking about humanity. I'll use that word, humanity or mankind. Mankind who belong to God are obliged to pray, obligated. They are not obliged to grow rich nor to make money. They are not obliged to have large success in businesses. These are incidental, occasional, uh, merely nominal as far as integrity to heaven and loyalty to God are concerned. Material successes are immaterial to God. 
Men are neither better nor worse with those things or without them. They are not sources of reputation nor elements of character in the heavenly estimates. But to pray, to really pray, is the source of revenue, is the basis of reputation, and the element of character in the estimation of God. Men are obliged to pray as they are obliged to be spiritual. Prayer is loyalty to God. Non-praying is to reject Christ and to abandon heaven. A life of prayer is the only life which heaven counts. How is your prayer life? How often do you pray? Do you like to pray? Think of those questions in light of what E.M. Bounds said. He goes on, he says, God is virtually concerned that men should pray. Men are bettered by prayer and the world is bettered by praying. God does his best to work for the world through prayer. God's greatest glory and man's highest good are secured by prayer. Prayer forms the godliest person and makes a godliest world. I think one of the reasons why we see so much sin and wickedness in the world today is simply because of the fact that people do not pray. The more we would pray, the more we would sense the truth of godliness. He goes on, he says, God has everything to do with prayer as well as everything to do with the one who prays. To him who prays, and as he prays, the hour of prayer is sacred because it's God's hour. Wow, when I read that, that got my attention. The hour spent in prayer is God's hour. You know, when it comes down to it, when we talk about how much time we spend in prayer and what our prayer life is like, is it not true that if we don't spend in time, if we don't spend time in prayer, we are actually saying to God, God, you don't matter to me. You don't matter to me. I've often said, even before I read this, that when it comes to prayer, and I appreciate our, our, our Saturday night prayer meetings, these men, listen, when I miss it, I, 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 I don't like it. And uh, if you're a man, say amen. amen. Then uh, I would invite you to visit us every Saturday night at 7.30. We have a great time. Last night it went a little longer than normal, and that was okay. In fact, that was good. Joshua gave a good message on prayer, and we discussed it. But I've mentioned relative to Saturday night that I think that things that we see in Sunday morning come as a result of that prayer time. And you've heard me say that I think that the things that we will see in our church throughout the course of this year is a result of this week of prayer. But one of the other things I've said before is this. When we pray, not only does God answer prayer and we see the benefit of that, but when we pray... God will bless us. Why? Because we've spent time with him. When we just set aside a time to pray and to talk to God, as Ian Bounds says, that's God's hour. And God's going to honor that. God's going to honor those who gather together on a Wednesday night to pray. God's going to honor those who come to this prayer conference. I believe that. God honors those men who pray on Saturday nights. And I mentioned several weeks ago that I'm praying that God will raise up a women's prayer meeting. Wouldn't that be great? Because it's talking to God. It makes us better citizens for the Lord. But God will honor it because the hour of prayer is sacred because it's God's hour. He goes on to say the occasion to pray is sacred because it is the occasion of the soul's approach to God and dealing with God. No hour is more hallowed because it is the occasion of the soul's mightiest approach to God and the fullest revelation from God. Men are more like God and men are more blessed when they spend time in prayer with the Most High God. Prayer makes and measures the approach of God. 
He knows not God who knows not how to pray. Listen to that. We talk many times here. You've heard me say that it's important as Christians that we get to, it's important that we get to, can you help me with this? It's important that we get to know who God is, what God expects, and what's the third one? How God operates. How do we do get to know all those things? Part of it is prayer. He knows not God who knows not how to pray. He has never seen God whose eye has not been couched for God in the closet, prayer closet. We talked about that this morning. God's vision is placed in the closet. God sees us when we spend time in the closet with Him. His dwelling place is in secret. He that dwelleth in the secret place to the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He has never studied God who has not had his intellect broadened, strengthened, clarified, and uplifted by prayer. Almighty God commands prayer. God waits on prayer to order his ways and delights in prayer. To God, prayer is what the incense was to the Jewish temple. It impregnates everything, perfumes everything, and sweetens everything. How's your prayer life? How much time do you spend in prayer? Do you attend prayer meetings regularly? He says, Almighty God is concerned in our praying. He wills it. He commands it. He inspires it. Jesus Christ is in heaven ever praying for us. Prayer is His law and His life. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to pray. He prays for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. All these show the deep concern of God in prayer. It discloses very clearly how vital it is to His work in this world and how far-reaching are the possibilities. Prayer forms the very center of the heart and will of God concerning mankind. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. By prayer, God's name is hallowed. By prayer, God's wisdom comes. God has nothing too good to give in answer to prayer. God loves to give through prayer. Prayer has all the force of God in it. Prayer can get anything which God has. Thus, prayer has all of its plea and its claim in the name of Jesus Christ, and there is nothing too good or great for God to do through prayer. How's your prayer life? How much time do you spend in prayer? How has your prayer life affected somebody else? Do you look for reasons to pray? When people say, pray for me, do you really pray for them? Prayer is talking with God. And as you recall this morning in my message, I gave the definition of genuine prayer by saying the genuine prayer is the communion of the believer's heart with God that is manifest in praise, petitions, supplications, intercessions, thanksgiving, and waiting upon the Lord, which has the goal to glorify God in all things. How's your prayer life? I would encourage you that when somebody comes up to you and says, would you pray for me? Pray for them right there so that you don't forget about it later on. And when a thought comes to your mind as you're going throughout the course of the day, pray for that thought. If a person's name comes to your mind throughout the course of the day, pray for that because the sovereign God could be implanting that person's name or that situation in our minds just to pray for them. Prayer gets things done. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, more things are wrought in this world by prayer than men dream of. I believe that's true. I think that if we prayed more, we would see more. But I think that if it's possible, when we get to heaven and look back to see what God's done through prayer, we'll say, wow, it's unbelievable what God did. The response to that probably then will be, how much more would we have been able to see God work if we had prayed more? I'd love to hear from you on answers to prayer. 
I got a email tonight that I wanted to read to you. It came from a Catholic in result, in response to this morning's prayer, or a half Catholic, or a part Catholic, or somebody thinks they might be a Catholic. But when we were talking about vain repetition, he basically said, you know, that's all Catholic prayers are. They pray the rosary and, you know, Holy Mary, Mother of God, da 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 da. Repetition and review. Not repetition and review, <laughs> repeating vain words. And he went on. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened, but I just completely deleted that email and went into outer space. I went to show Nancy to it and it was gone. I even had Sarah O'Day try to find it tonight in here and it's gone. So I wrote to the fellow and I said, please write back to me because I, I'd love to read that to you folk. You know, in, in preaching messages like I preached this morning, I, I wonder how God uses it in the lives of people and I'd like to read it for you. But this fellow is going to send today, he's going to get a copy of today's telecast and send it to the Pope. And he's also going to call all of his Catholic friends and ask them to watch it when it comes on the air Thursday night and next Sunday morning. I said to Nancy, he's going to get into trouble. (laughs) If the Pope shows up here next Sunday morning, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. But the point of it was, you know, we talked about vain repetition. We talked about just saying words and... Unfortunately, many times that's all our prayers are. The same words. And we rush through those. And yet, prayer is the key to godliness. Prayer is the key to to spiritual strength. Prayer is the key to effective ministry. Prayer is the key to a a productive Christian life. If you don't pray, you'll do nothing effective for the Lord consistently. Oh, something might happen every now and then. But if you don't pray, you'll do nothing effective for the Lord consistently. And this church, if it's not a prayer-minded church, may as well close the doors. Without prayer, we can do nothing. I have here in this passage of Scripture eight great principles of prayer, and we don't have the time to delve into them tonight. I don't want to take the time to delve into them tonight, but I do want to share them with you for your consideration. Isn't it amazing how much is in one little verse? One little verse of Scripture could keep a person preaching forever, and this is one of those. Jesus is teaching, to, he's talking to his disciples, you know. He, he, he cursed the fig tree and it's as though Peter was surprised. Because it says in verse 20, after he had cursed the fig tree, that in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up. And Peter calling to remember said to them, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. Well, Lord, look what happened to that tree. Old Peter was always putting his foot in his mouth. Can you imagine what Jesus might have wanted to say to Peter? You dumb bell. I'm God. Whatever I say happens. And it did. But he was nice. He said, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he hath, he saith. And then he says, therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, what are these eight great principles of prayer in this passage? Well, first of all, in this passage we see the authority of prayer. 
starts out there in verse 24 where Jesus says, Therefore I say. Who is it that calls us to prayer? It's not the preacher. It's not the priest in the sense of this Catholic fellow that wrote. It's not your mom. It's not your dad. It's Jesus who talks about prayer. He is the one who's the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all things, the savior of the world, the God of all of eternity, the author and the personification of truth. This is the one who is the authority of prayer. This is the king of kings, the Lord Jesus, who says, I say unto you. And then he talks about prayer. In fact, it's God who gives us the invitation to pray. Back in Jeremiah 33, 3, God says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be answered unto you. You see, prayer is what God wants. Prayer is what God desires. Prayer is what God calls for. And prayer is what enables us to see God work. The authority of prayer is God himself. What about the participant of prayer? Look again at the verse. Therefore, I say unto you. And he was talking to those who were believers in him. True believers in Jesus Christ. You know, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12 teaches, teaches us that God is not obligated to hear the prayer of the unsaved. The Bible says his eyes are against them. You often hear of unsaved people say, well, I pray. I pray a lot. Well, you know, the prayer of the unsaved doesn't get out of the room that it's in. And when you turn back to Psalm 66 and verse 18, it says that Psalmist David says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord what? Will not hear me. And so an unsaved person isn't who Jesus is talking to here, or a person who's in sin as a believer isn't who Jesus is talking to. The precipitant of prayer is the one who is truly born again and living for the Lord in obedience. The third thing we see is the product of prayer. Notice, he says, Therefore I say unto you, what's that next word? You say it. What's that next word? Look at your Bibles. Not the one on the screen. Look at your Bible. It says, therefore I say unto you, what's, whatsoever, you got it, whatsoever ye desire, whatsoever things ye desire. Think about that. The product of prayer relates to what things we desire. What do you pray for? When we talk about whatsoever things we desire, there are certain qualifications and and, and certain stipulations related to that. First of all, uh, these things that we pray for are prayed for from the basis of a right Christian practice. In other words, if we are going to see God really answer prayer, there are certain things we must be doing. Let's turn to John chapter 15. If you don't mind, please. John chapter 15. And we see two verses there that teach us the foundation for praying for what we desire to the point that we might see God work. John chapter 15, verse 7. Notice, Jesus says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. You see, abiding in Christ talks about walking with Christ, fellowshipping with Christ, being at home with Christ, having Christ at home with you. It talks about a real relationship with Christ. He says, When you abide with me... uh, You shall ask what you will, and it'll be done. And so when we talk about the the product of prayer is whatsoever things, if we're going to ask God to do things and see God work, then we need to be abiding in Him. But then drop down to verse 16, where Jesus says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that, or in order that, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. 
Yes, God through Christ promises that whatsoever things we ask we'll receive, but it's based upon having the right Christian practice of abiding with Christ and being fruitful for the Lord. If you're not walking with Christ, if I'm not walking with Christ, if I'm not bearing fruit for the Lord, then my prayer life is going to be hindered. Another aspect of of praying for whatsoever things we want and seeing God work indicates that we must be praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. We see that in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Let's turn back there for a moment. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. There, at the end of this great teaching on the armor of God, in verse 18 of Ephesians 6, Paul says, praying always with what? All prayer and supplication. You know, the word prayer means just communing with God. Supplication means earnest prayer for a particular thing until you see God bring it to pass. And he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. You see, we're to pray in the power of the Spirit, and what does that mean? I mentioned this morning that effective prayer is directed to God the Father in the name of God the Son through the direction, the leadership, and the power of God the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 teaches us that when we pray, we don't know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession with us with groanings that cannot be uttered to the point that by the time that our prayer gets to heaven, it's what God wants it to be. That's what we are talking about when we talk about praying in the Spirit. And in reality, it means depending upon the Holy Spirit to lead in our prayer life and then to intercede in our prayer before Almighty God the Father. You say, how does the Spirit of God lead us? Well, you see, there's something that needs to be coupled with prayer if we're going to see the Spirit of God leading us in our prayer, and that's the reading and the study of the Word of God. Whatsoever things prayed for from the basis of the right Christian practice, prayed for in the power of the Holy Spirit, prayed for, thirdly, with the proper motive. Let's go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, and notice verses 1 through 4. Particularly verses 1 through 3. James chapter 4 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. As we studied this morning, the whole concept of prayer is to bring glory to God. And if we pray unto the Lord to get what we want, to make us look better, to make us feel better, uh, to, to give us better things in life, and we forget praying that God will be honored and glorified, then we're not going to receive the answer. No matter what we pray for, food, clothing, shelter, whatever, If the true heart in prayer to glorify God is not there, then the prayer is vain. If the desire to glorify God is there, then we'll receive the answer. And then number four, in the product of prayer, we have whatsoever things we ask when we are praying according to the will of God. Praying according to the will of God. Go to 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. The word of God says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desired of him. If we are going to see God work and give us those whatsoever things, we need to pray in accordance with God's will. That simply means, number one, again, we couple the word of God with our prayer. Before we spend time in prayer, we should spend time in the word of God. But then when we begin to ask God for things, we should ask, are these things according to your will, Father? 
You know, I, I shouldn't pray that if I go out and rob a bank tonight, I won't get caught. Why? Well, it's not God's will to rob a bank, is it? There's a lot I can say on this, but do you get the point? Going back to our passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 11, yes, when we pray, we can pray for whatever we want, as long as we are praying from the basis of the right Christian practice in the power of the Spirit with a proper motive and according to the will of Almighty God. Let's go back to Mark chapter 11. I may not go down through all of these tonight. I may leave you hanging a little bit and watching the clock. We, we want to fellowship around the Lord's table. We see the authority of prayer. It's Christ. We see the partition of prayer. It's those of us who are true believers and obedient believers in Christ. The product of prayer. Number four, we, we see the need of prayer. He says, therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire. And, and, and I'm not going to elaborate upon that, but that desire hopefully would be the needs that we have in our life. Uh, spiritual protection, as we see in Matthew 6. We talked about that this morning. Our daily needs, as we would see also in Matthew 6, as well as others. You know, the Bible tells us that we are to be praying for one another. And we could add a whole lot more to that. But obviously, the desire would be that which is according to the will of God. But he goes on, and he says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray... Now, what is not in that phrase? What word is not there? If we pray. Right. When you pray. It goes along with what we were saying this morning. Christ assumes that we are prayer-minded people. And we should be praying. Uh, prayer should be a regular part of our life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says we are to pray without ceasing. And one of the reasons, and I can list many reasons, or I should say results of prayer, but one of them is that it is a remedy for anxiety. Anybody ever have any anxiety attacks or get fearful? You know, the solution to that is prayer. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells us that when we pray, we won't be anxious, but we will experience the peace of God. But notice, number six, the key to prayer. And like I said, I can't get into all this tonight because we're cutting it short. But one little word, what is it? Believe. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things ye desire when ye pray, believe. Believe. Have faith in the all-powerful God. You notice in this passage of Scripture, faith and belief is talked about several times. Look in verse 22. It says, Jesus answering, saith unto them, have faith in God. That's the same as belief. Verse 23, he says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall what? Believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he, he saith. And then he says here in verse 24, Therefore I say unto you that uh, what things soever uh, ye desire when ye pray, believe. You see, effective prayer is based on having faith in God. Effective prayer is based on having faith in God. You know, when we pray, do we believe our prayers? Do we have faith that God's going to work? You've heard me say this before. It's like a, a lady who once lived in front of a huge mountain, and every night, or one night, she got tired of looking at that mountain. And so before she went to bed that one night, she prayed, Lord, she said, Lord, please remove this mountain. And she woke up in the morning, and that mountain was still there. And she said to God, well, God, just as I figured, you weren't going to take it away. Not faith. Prayer is based upon having faith in God. And the essence and the effect of our prayer is based on the reality of God in our life. Think about that. 
The essence and the effect of our prayer is based upon the reality of God in our life. In other words, do we believe God or not? Do we have faith in God or not? In other words, if we're going to see God work, we have to have faith in God who's the object of our faith, the object of our prayer. Do we have faith that God's going to work? Jesus said, if you, have, if you believe in God, if you have faith in God, and you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the midst of the sea, that's going to happen. The effect of prayer depends upon the bigness of God in our lives. If we believe in the greatness of God, the power of God, then we will see the working of God. We will trust God. We'll have faith in God. We will see him, him work. And so if we don't see God work and if we're not praying in faith and believing, we're sort of admitting that we don't have a very big God in our thoughts. And yet he's the almighty God. Number seven, we see the outcome of prayer. He says, pray, when you pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. That's the promise of the Lord. We already talked about Jeremiah 33, 3, where God says, call unto me and, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Matthew 7, 7 and 8, where Jesus says, ask and it shall be given, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be added unto you. The question is, do we believe that? And then finally, the stipulation for prayer. Verse 25, he says, when ye stand praying. And you might ask the question, why is that word stand there? Well, you see, back in the, the day of Christ, it was common when people prayed to stand up. Standing up always shows respect for God. That's why we stand when we sing. And back in those days, they would stand and pray to show respect unto God. But he says, when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any. That your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. There's a lot that we could say upon that. But the fact of the matter is, listen, if we go to the Lord in prayer and there's one person that we have not forgiven, then not only does that hinder our prayer life? But because we haven't forgiven, we are living in sin. Carrying a grudge, not forgiving people, is living in sin. So we must make certain that we, we have a forgiving spirit. Prayer is so simple. All we need to do is practice it according to biblical truth. You know that? It's all we need to do. And Jesus very clearly relates to us in the Gospels. We looked at Matthew this morning. We look at Mark tonight. Looking forward to seeing what the, some of the men are going to be sharing throughout the course of the week. But I go back to these questions that I ask. How do you describe your prayer life? Do you like to pray? Do you look for opportunities to pray? You remember the rest of them, don't you? Now, I'll just conclude on this one question. What does your prayer life tell others about your walk with God? What does your prayer life tell others about your walk with God? We probably all would fall short, wouldn't we? But boy, it's a good question to ask. If prayer is communing with God and if prayer is talking with God, then we should want to develop a prayer life where consistently we are communing with God because keep in mind that prayer is precious to God. As, as Ian Bound said, the hour that we spend in prayer is sacred to God because we are spending it with God and excluding everybody else and everything else. 
Throughout the next three nights, we'll be gathering here to hear some devotions on prayer, and then we'll be praying. We'll be praying through this prayer guide. And as you know, we, it's no bells or whistles. We don't come in and have special music. We don't come in and, and do anything. We come in and hear the word of God, and then we go to prayer. Haley Heaton came to me recently and said, we need to have an all-night prayer meeting. I said, that sounds great to me. And she went back to school today. So I said, we'll get together. We'll plan it. Church I used to pastor in Lebanon, New Year's Eve. We would start at 7 o'clock and go to midnight with a service. And then from midnight to 6 in the morning, we'd pray all night. God blessed that ministry and brought revival because of that. When we pray, we'll see God work as we pray according to the teaching of Scripture. I behoove you. Pray for our ministry. Remember, three times a day, 8 o'clock, noon, and, 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 and 5. Or any other time. But this week, for your sake in walking with God, and for the sake of our church doing the will of God in 2018, spend time in prayer. If you can be here each night, do so. If you can't, spend time in prayer with us from 7 to 8 or some other time. With prayer, we'll see God work. Without it, we won't. How's our prayer life? How are we going to change it? Let's give that serious thought. Let's stand for prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we come to